I need you to get your Bibles and I want you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to share a little bit here. We started a message last week and I told you it would take us a couple of weeks to kind of get through it. And what we did last week is we talked about the why we do what we do. You know, it's very, very difficult to get to the how, right? Everybody wants to know, how are we going to get everything done that God wants us to get done, right? How am I going to handle this in my home? How am I going to lead my children in faith when I know that they're going into a school that there's going to be influences all day long? How are we going to do all this stuff? Listen to me. The how is second. The primary is why. If you know why you're doing what you're doing, it doesn't matter how. It's just going to get done. You're going to do whatever it takes to get it done because you understand the why. And so we set that up last week. If you missed that message, we're going to do our best to have that published for you. You can go online and check that out. But today, I want to talk to you about a very, very special season that we're in as a church. And I believe that God's going to speak to us through this, uh, the book of Nehemiah this morning. And before I get started, I want to recognize Pastor Scott. Man, come on, why don't you stand with your family and, and those that have come with you today. This is Lawrence and Kay's former pastor, and they work alongside them here in support of them today. Glad to have them. And is my mother-in-law here? Would you stand? Oh, my goodness. She, she, there she is. Would you? <laughs> she like, real fast. That is my mother-in-law. She's my favorite mother-in-law. <laughs> It's the only one I've got, and I'm her favorite son-in-law because I'm the only one she's got. So uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Of course, her husband is Pastor Jim McNabb. I served under their leadership for six years. Uh, yes, they were my in-laws, and yes, they were my bosses, but I cherished every moment. And I appreciate what you guys did for us, uh, giving us you know, the foundation so that we could come to a family like this and be effective. You guys were a huge part of that. So could you please put your hands together for my mother-in-law. Thank you. <laughs> In the book of Nehemiah, I just, can I just get right into it today? You know, we, we could start with stories. I could start with a joke. I could get you rolling. We've been in the presence of God. And I just believe when God's presence is tangible, we need to take the handles that he's given us and we need to move this thing forward and apply it into our life. And so in a very, very real way, I'm going to talk to you about our, our present reality as a church. We're going to just kind of bring in a little bit of the cultural context today. But mainly, I just want you to understand, we're going to get a little bit to the how at the end of this message. Because y'all are really, really excited with the idea that we have a master plan. That the idea that we're going to be you know, using the capital funds that are in this facility right now and, and, and modifying our current setting and maybe even adding facilities. But listen to me, that is all secondary. It has nothing, buildings don't matter. <laughs> Dollars don't matter. Okay, you're, you're probably freaking out right now. They don't. People matter. Amen. Jesus didn't die for a building. He didn't die for a particular area. He died for you. Yes. And listen, when, when we get that in our heart, that, that he died for humanity, then at all costs we're going to do whatever it takes to get to the one. And I, I just need you to understand this before we get started as well. You, you've heard me say it several times. We love our facilities here. We like to say that we're debt-free, and that's a wonderful gift of God for those leaders that, that have led before I got here. We came into a situation where we could leverage every dollar to ministry. But I want to tell you something. This facility is not sacred to God. Don't get mad at me. Just let me finish. The grounds here are not sacred to God. The pews, the artifacts, the whatever you think, the programs, that they do not matter to God. What matters to God is the people that are in this space. And so the building, the dollars, the programs, the things that we have, listen to me, write it down. They're tools, tools of the trade. They are tools to help us achieve what God has called and commissioned us as a church to do. What is that? To strengthen our relationship with God, first of all and foremost, that when you come into this place, we're going to love God together, right? Say it with me. We love God, we love, and we love God. That's what we do. So the first thing that we, we have to make sure that our facilities give us an environment to love God and grow an enrichment, uh, an, an enrichment process for that. We have to make sure that our facilities and our grounds and our tools, our dollars, are invested so that we can grow in relationship with each other. Because that's the second commandment. Love God with all your heart and then love each other, he says. Love your neighbors yourself. And then we want to make sure that we're an influence outside this church. And just can I paint a picture real quick? I'm going to give you some stats we, we have our, our work cut out for us. If we really want to wrap our heart around the mission of God for this church, it, it'll blow your mind, the opportunity he's put right in our backyard. It'll blow your mind. And I just pray that today 
through the Holy Spirit of God, you'll be able to see a bigger picture and be able to pray a deeper prayer and a more meaningful prayer so that our future can be on track with what God is desiring for us. In the book of Nehemiah, this is an individual that, let me just tell you this, I thank God that we're in a country that is free, all right? And we are free to talk, we're free to dream, we're free to write what we want to write and do whatever we want to do. And you're here today, you dressed the way you wanted to, you drove whatever road you wanted to, and you're at the church you chose to be at. And you need to thank God for that freedom and thank those that have allowed that freedom to be uh, our choice today. But in Nehemiah's case, his country was conquered by the Babylonians. They swept into that place and they scooped up everybody they could, and Nehemiah was one of those, and he was placed into servitude. He, he wasn't born in slavery, but he ended up in slavery. He ended up in slavery because God's people were constantly rebelling against God. And God said, I'm going to lift my hand from you if you don't stop sinning, if you don't stop practicing idolatry. Listen, we're in a, a very, very interesting place and time in our history where our nation is dabbling in things it's never dabbled in before. This isn't a political platform, but you've got to understand, if we don't right the ship now, we could end up a lot like what we're about to talk about today. So Nehemiah is a product of a bigger picture. He ends up having to serve a king, and he's serving the king in the way of being a cupbearer. He doesn't have a say. He doesn't have any influence. He doesn't have a position. He ain't making any money. He is a servant. But listen to me, God can use anybody anywhere at any time, and it doesn't matter what you think you lack, God can make it abundant if that's what he wants to do. And you're going to see a picture of a church, your church, in, an, in an, a place of abundance. And I'm not talking about dollars, I'm talking about effectiveness at the end of this message. And I want you to get excited about what God is doing just through you. But I also want you to carry a burden this morning that we're not even scratching the surface yet. We're not even close to what God is wanting to realize in our lives through this community, through this city, through this state, through this nation, and ultimately the world that God is giving us access to. So as we're about to read in the book of Nehemiah, you gotta understand, he, this guy was scooped up, he's placed into slavery, he's living a life he didn't wanna live, but even in that moment, he is gonna realize a destiny in a God-ordained moment that is going to just blow us away. Pick up in chapter 1 with me, verse 2. Now, although he was a servant, he was still able to have contact with his family. Okay, He was still able to have conversations with people that mattered to him. And this is one of those conversations. Hananiah, one of my brothers, this is Nehemiah speaking, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. That's where he used to live, that was conquered, and all those people were scooped up. He's just saying, man, what is home like anymore? <laughs> Tell me about it. I, I, are things okay? And verse 3, he, uh, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province uh, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God, the God of heaven. Can I just tell you, skip to verse 11 with me. This is the prayer that Nehemiah began to pray. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Listen, desperate situation where he was raised, where his founding fathers, the, the, there was an honor that he wanted to uphold. But where he was, he was physically restricted. Definitely his emotions were, were in check. You understand what I'm saying? Spiritually, what is he going to do? He's a cupbearer to the king, the rival king that conquered the land. And yet he knows there's a deep longing to see the land of his forefathers built back up, strengthened. He had no leverage, none. How many of you have been sitting at home with zero leverage, but yet you know there is a burning desire within your heart to do something great for God? And that something is like right there, you can almost touch it, but there's just zero resources, zero leverage, zero opportunity that you can see with your physical eyes or understand, right, in your, your, your normal state. This is where Nehemiah was, but he stopped, and he did something very, very interesting to me as he prayed. He knew that his hands couldn't accomplish it, but he knew that the God of every God could. The king, as we call the king of kings and lord of lords, could accomplish anything. Last week I showed you how Paul was in a similar situation. If you'll go back and watch that, you'll understand. 
He was praying over Ephesus. Paul, being a New Testament person that we've talked about in the Bible, an apostle of God, and and he's out there praying over this city, and he's praying that the gospel, the message of Christ, could invade a sin-filled community. A community a lot like what we're drifting into. We're dabbling into things like idolatry and false belief systems and we're, we're elevating people and we're celebrating things that are wrong in our society. There's got to be a remnant. There's got to be someone on the back door praying right now that God would restore his message, that God would restore the gospel. Give us an effective way and a means that can get to a people that don't know the truth just yet. And Paul was praying that prayer. In fact, he, he prayed the prayer in 1 Corinthians And basically it was this, praying for a great door for effective work. And we know the answer to that, the door was opened. We talked about the uniqueness of that last week. Nehemiah began to pray for an effective door to be opened to him. And the only way this was going to happen is if God was going to open that door by his own strength. Go to chapter 2, verse 4. Nehemiah ends up coming into the king's presence and he's a little down. He's obviously been praying. He's been weeping. He's been fasting. And, and, and how many know that, that we're not really good with, with keeping our emotions to ourselves? <laughs> all right? So I mean, some of y'all walked in today, and you're like, I, I, I got to hold it all together. I can't let anybody know what's going on at home. But you walked in like this. When somebody says, how you doing? You go, I've been better. Right? It's just hard when it's a deep, burning passionate desire of yours, you can't contain it. And in this particular case, Nehemiah didn't want to make a scene. He wasn't trying to make it about himself, but as he was serving, there was, a, there was a quickening that happened to the person that needed to know. If you're just honest with God, there'll be a quickening in your circle of people of influence, and the one that needs to know will know why you feel the way you feel, where you're at, and how they can help you out. And in this particular case, in verse 4, the king said to me, What is it you want? Isn't that interesting? The king, without Nehemiah saying anything, said, What is it, Nehemiah, cupbearer, servant, I conquered you, but what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven in verse 5, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Can I just tell you something? That's like political suicide for the conquering nation to send someone back as a delegate to rebuild the walls of the city they've already conquered. Does that make any sense at all? Why would you fund that? Why would you resource? Why would you even entertain the notion of sending somebody back that you've already conquered and let them rebuild, refortify, give new life back to a group of people that you've already conquered? Doesn't even make sense. Last week, we talked about the why, right? We talked about the why. Everybody wants to know, how are we going to get it done around here? How are we going to build new buildings? How are we going to reach a community that seems to to be so distant at times? How are we going to get into the school systems when when the schools won't even let us pray anymore, won't let us bring our Bibles anymore, and different things like that? Can I tell you that God has opened an effective door already to us to the school district. And if you want your kids to go and pray, send them to go and pray. My son, he runs a Bible study in his school. As a sixth grader, he went to the principal and he said, ma'am, I'd like to have a Bible study. And he, she said, well, you gotta have a student, you gotta have a teacher that'll be a sponsor. And he goes, I've already found that one. Because he noticed that that teacher's uh, phone rang with a Toby Mac song. So he went straight to that teacher and said, would you sponsor me? And she said, well, you've got to talk to the principal. So he went and talked to the principal. Then he tells his dad, hey, dad, I had an uh, appointment with the principal today. I was like, whoa. You know, in my, my day, if you talk to the principal, that was, that was bad. You know, I avoided the principal like a plague. My son's setting appointments these days to go talk to the principal because he wants to have a Bible study. Now listen to me. We have an effective open door. Did you know your superintendent is a believer? Did you know that many, many, many of our teachers are faith-filled, spirit-filled believers that are praying for effective doors to be open for your kids all the time? We've worked with Reed. We've worked across the street last last year. We're going to find another school to work with this year, and every single one of them, they've opened their doors wide to us in any way that we could possibly be effectively influencing the children because they love those kids. We have those opportunities, and now we know why. Let me just give you the stats. 
Why is it that we're so passionate about our kids? Why is it that I'm, I'm bringing these things up in such intensity right now? Because right now, we know within a seven mile radius of this church, I need to write this down so I don't have to keep saying it. Just know it. Within seven miles of your church, there's 600,000 people living. That would be the 26th largest city in America. 600,000. Let me, let, me, let, let me make it a little bit more real. 38% are children. Did you know only 18% of the 600,000 18% of the 600,000 are in church today? Not that that matters, because we know a lot of people are in church, but... We believe that those that chose to come to church are, are serving the Lord Jesus. All right? 18% of that number. That's it. What is that? 82% are sitting at home today as parents deciding what their family are going to do. And that means that number is reaching almost 200,000 kids are sitting at home without a choice today. They're just not going to hear about Jesus. They're going to hear about other things of this world and, and, and do other things. Does that make sense to you? So when I say seven miles in our backyard, the potential for us to influence a life for a lifetime is to the number of almost 200,000. Do you think there's enough room on our campus for 200,000 kids? Say no. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. But we have space. We still have room. We could double up in services if we need to. There is a burning desire within me to reach every single one of those kids. That's why we do what we do around here. That's why we're passionately invading our school district with opportunity for these kids to be a part of what we're doing. Why? Because there's 200,000 kids within our reach for Christ. Why? Because Revelation 20:15 says, anyone whose name is not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's why 200,000 kids in our backyard may not make heaven if we don't get after it. Can I just say, I can't let anyone else take the burden. I can't let Pastor Sakwan Lee next door in our Korean Baptist church or the other English speaking campus next to him or the church across the street or anybody, I can't, I can't put that burden on them. God's given me that burden. And when we stand before God and he says, what did you do to perpetuate the gospel of my son Jesus? You know what we're going to say? We did everything we could knowing there were 200,000 kids that needed Jesus, knowing that there were 600,000 that lived within seven miles of this church, knowing that only 18% were in church. We did everything we could. Every dollar we had, every minute we had, every moment we had, we invested it into your kingdom because we wanted to see your kingdom expand. Now listen. Last week, well, let me just tell you this. It's our time to win back the credibility of the church. I'm not naive. There's a reason why only 18% are in church today. There's a reason. It's because the church that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If we were to drive down the road today and go into any given church, I would pray that it would be a representative of that. But I can't be accountable for every church. I can only be accountable for this one. And this one, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to be an effective voice for our community. It's going to be the church that Jesus gave his life for. We're not going to be average, and, and we're going to fight that you know, until the day I'm not here. You're going to know it's going to be fought tooth and nail. We won't be average. So the things that we do, you know, it's going to be missional. It's not, it may not be practical, but it's going to be missional. And that's, just, that's my commitment to you. And this is what we've done to set this up. Uh, we decided, I did, I, and because when I lead, I'm just saying we. Here we go. We decided that before we would ever put a dollar into this facility, like to the master plan dollar, we wanted to sow into the kingdom of God. I got this from this wonderful lady over here's husband. Because every time they added any facility, any time they added any major construction moment or change or shift to home, they always made sure they... They, they were sowing into the kingdom of God beyond themselves to the tune of building a church for a different denomination down the street, giving them a, like frontage access, cool stuff, to the tune of, of sending missionaries and doing missional work. I'm just telling you, it's in me to understand the value of that. So what did I do? I presented to you guys an opportunity back in February, right? I know that Madagascar, we're a primary partner to our teams in Madagascar, and they need churches, right? Your pastor has a crazy idea that through this church 
and through the legacy of maybe our kids and their kids, that we'll be able to train 300 pastors, plant 800 churches, and have 40,000 people in the Southern Escarpment that can share the name of Jesus effectively. Therefore, we don't need to be there anymore. That's my vision. That's our vision for Christ and the message of Jesus to, to, to invade uh, a nation, literally. And we are the primary partners. So when I asked you to partner with me in sowing seed in February, I called Madagascar. I said, look, we need blueprints. If you send me blueprints, we're going to build some churches for you because we're going to sow in the kingdom before we take care of the house. Okay? Your response, I got to tell you, was in abundance because we received that offering. I went back to my office on Monday before the offering, we count on Tuesdays, okay? So Monday, I get an email from our team in Madagascar, and it's not good news. A cyclone took out six of the churches we've already built, okay? That's frustrating, okay? Especially when I'm ready to build new ones. And now they call me and they say, look, Pastor, we understand that you just received some monies, and we have no idea. It could be 1000 It could be 20000 We just don't know, but... Can we use that money first to rebuild what we need to rebuild? And if there's money left over, then we'll put it to new construction. You want? Know my heart was on the floor because I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, fine. Yes, that's what has to take place. We're sending money not to control the money. We're sending money to the need. And y'all control that. We counted the money. And your pastor got to type them a letter. I typed them a letter, our area director a letter, and the person who introduced me to the project a letter. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, please proceed with 10 new churches. Then those are $7,000 a piece. You can do the math. 10 new construction, that is concrete and metal. Please put back the six that are on the ground. And please consider four new locations for churches. That is in abundance do you, do you realize what just happened? Over $100,000 came in one offering and we wrote the check and sent it to them. And they're like, what? Because God was ready to do something over and above what our mind and our heart could fathom. We've never received an offering of that magnitude. We've never been able to meet a need of that magnitude. And in one day, in one day, this church did it. I gotta fast forward a little bit because it's really, really cool stuff. Our uh, <clears throat> Light for the Lost commitment. This year, Life of the Lost is it's the resource arm of our world missionary covering, if you will, at the national level. Life of the Lost. When you hear me say a fire Bible offering, when you hear me say we're going to provide literature, curriculum, whatever, our missionaries go all over the planet. And then we resource our missionaries through Life of the Lost arm. We wrote a $20,000 check while I was doing the tour. I got the privilege of speaking on tour, and it was a very enlightening moment. And I just felt the Lord say, you got to give 20 now. We had it because you guys are so stinking generous. It's awesome. So I was like, here, 20000 just cover the gap. And then I came back, and where's Jim? Dude, I sat with you, and I said, Jim, with the men's department, <laughs> we got to come up with a number. And I said, what's a, what's a number that we could come up with? And what was your first response? $2,000. 2000 <laughs> Is that mic work? That's cool. You got a mic. I'll wait for you. I said $2,000. All right. What was my response? Dude, you got to give more than that. I said, we've already given 20. We got to do better than two. This is a faith promise. Then what? Well, my faith wasn't as big as his. <laughs> and then I said, oh, we'll give 20,000. And I said, we've already done that. What else can we do? I mean, just go big. What did you I say? Said, my, my numbers don't go that high. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, 40,000? 40. So we've already given 20, and I thought 40 would be an awesome number for us to achieve because that, that's respectable. That's awesome. An additional $40,000 to come in to resource the arm of our missionaries. And can I tell you, we're planning and trying to get together a golf tournament, trying to do some like a, a, a nice cook, a night cookout and stuff like that to raise these monies. I come to you and I say, the warrior Bible, right? Fire Bible. Man, if God's put it in your heart, let's do something for our military. This Bible specifically created for them. And I explained the value of it. Robert Solomon came and he received an offering. Can I tell you that in that offering, $55,000 came in for Light for the Lost. Praise God, because that's, that's kind of like, oh yeah. Praise God. 
So when I was at the Fire Bible Summit this last week, they sucked another five out of me, so I wrote it for 60. And now we're at, what, 80,000 already turned in. That is called abundance. That's better than what we thought we could do, just scraping every dollar we possibly could by the end of the year. Are you seeing a picture? Are you seeing the pattern? There was also some programming that we paid for. We paid a company to come look at the church, the health of our church, the health of our community, the grounds, everything. Tell us, do we stay? Do we go? Remember, we, we had these questions that were lurking and looming. You know, uh, uh, how fast is the community growing? Are we a reflection of our community? And can I just tell you, it's nearly a mirror image. The, the community outside these walls, the ethnicity, the age, and everything in this house, it's nearly a mirror image within 2% for the kids is all. All right, And we showed you those stats last week. We are our community. God has already prepared that way for us. And in fact, the programming numbers tell us that we shouldn't have this many people on campus, 600 whatever people on campus, on any given week for several years because we have to grow with the community because the numbers they had that we gave them the first three years. Can I tell you that we've eclipsed those up until like last week. Every single week, we've eclipsed that number. That's called abundance. It's over and above what we had thought we were going to be at this time. It's over and above what any plan or dream we had. This is exceeding every single line of our expectation. Our youth department, we're, you know, Chris and Vanessa are out this week. They're on vacation, a well-deserved vacation, a well-deserved getaway. How many of y'all appreciate what Chris and Vanessa are doing with our youth? This is a young man that God provided us, one of our own. He stepped into leadership and he was given 95 students. I need to tell you something. That is a large youth group. 95 students on any Wednesday night is a large youth group. Anybody would love to have 100 students or a church of 100. There's a lot of pastors out there who would love to have a church of 100. Chris and Vanessa, with their leadership and God's help, since January, they average over 150 every single week. Now you got to understand, that's overwhelming. And we have a young leader, and he's always coming to me, Pastor, we are going wide fast. Teach me to go deep. And that's exactly what we're doing. So I appreciate the leader that we have. And we're working with him on spiritual significance and leadership development and the things that are going to matter to sustain this so that your students don't get lost as a number, but that your students have a name and they have a place and a place to grow and to thrive and to develop their gifts. And that's our commitment. That's, that's abundance. Can I just tell you that he... He set a goal to go to camp this year and called the district and said, hey, uh, would you guys be willing to open up 100 spots for us at camp this year? And the district kind of chuckled. That's what they do sometimes. Those of us in leadership that have been there done that, right? That's just silliness. That's just a dream, a visionary dream. Okay, yeah. We'll, we never really have more than, you didn't bring, what, 40, 50 last year? We'll give you 75 spots. If you fill that up, call us. So the next week he called and he said, hey, could you open up another 25 plus because we have 104 signed up to go to camp. Amen. All right, so I'm going to take an offering right now. I'm just kidding. Because we need two buses and a van to take our youth to camp this year. It's really awesome. It's going to be a $10,000 trip. I love that. I love spending money in the right way. Amen. Praise God for that. So let's keep moving in this great and effective door that's open to us. I could go on and on and on. If you were at our business meeting, you saw I had, I didn't even get to finish all the, the uh, testimonies of people and, and what this church has meant to them. I'm not talking about just, that wasn't a, a, a hey, look at me as a pastor moment. That was effective ministry in the lives of real people. That's what we wanted to share. That's what I want you to understand. Every one of you should have a place of effective ministry opportunity here. Here's how we get done. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is, this, church, this is the church that was being birthed through the power of the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts. We know that the Holy Spirit filled that upper room, uh, empowered them with a greater witness. We know that the Holy Spirit is alive and at work today and is also administering those gifts just like then. They're doing, the Holy Spirit's doing now. But in verse 42 through 47, I want to read this together and just kind of capitalize on this moment. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed at the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. That's called unity. That's called knowing where you're going and why you're doing that, right? 
Understanding the why, the how just kind of began to unfold as they were working together, as they were fellowshipping together, as they were praying together, as they were breaking bread together. The, the why was set up first because it's the message of Christ. Jesus died. We now have a new, what they're calling a new covenant, a new circumcision of the heart, a new value. It's the, it's the heart. It's no longer this, this law anymore. So now they're perpetuating this and they're doing it together. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who needed In verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can I just tell you this? You know, uh, I'm ready to see that. I'm ready to see that. You know what? I, I The one word that comes to mind when we read this scripture is everyone. Everyone. Every single person in this place, every one of our family members that's traveling, anyone viewing online, calling this church home, unable to be here today, everyone is represented in that scripture. Everyone's needed. And let me just kind of paint a little bit more. Everyone has a place to belong here at this church. If you want to bring your friend, you want to bring your family, you don't have to fear. Will they belong? Will they be accepted? Of course they will. You are? They are too. Everyone belongs. Everyone has a place to grow. Everyone has a place to become what God has created and redeemed them to be. And you understand that fully here at this church. Everyone will have the chance to discover their purpose. Everyone will be given a place to serve and to use their ministry gifts. And it begins now. It it begins now. There's no other way to say it. Jeremy, I know I didn't ask you to to prepare anything, but I want you to stand up, turn around, tell everyone today how many stinking kids you brought to church today and how many of them are yours. (laughs) <laughs> how many are yours? Two. You know how you build? You take action. You do something about it. Why would you consider calling the church, hey, can we borrow a van? Can we borrow a bigger car than we got? Because we got all these kids. It's because you knew those kids in your neighborhood were going to be sitting at home. 200,000 of them are sitting at home today. And unless one of us takes the initiative, they'll stay there. But today, 10 of them got to show up. Eight of them are maybe here in Jesus' name for the first time in their life. And can I just tell you something? That's a reality in our, our, our city. My neighbor, and you would think, you know, in our world today, that kids, our kids, would, would know who Jesus is. My daughter was playing in, in our, our driveway, and her, her little friend next door came over, and they started talking. She said, oh, I have to go to church. And her, our neighbor's friend said, what is church? And my daughter said, it's where we learn about Jesus. And she said, who's Jesus? Can I just tell you, though, the interesting thing was her family was giving us a thousand bottles of water a month because they had a heart for the needy, but they didn't know who Jesus was. Think about that. God, give us an effective door of opportunity. That family today is serving in another church near their home, and I thank God that now they know who Jesus is. I thank God for that. But it took a moment, a weird moment with a child and a realization that not everybody's going to know what you know. Not everybody's going to do what you do, have the background that you have. But we got to take an initiative. And was it hard to do that this morning or was it more fun? It was more fun. It was more fun. Well, you got a whole van. Well, I don't know. Are you going to stop for, for ice cream or something? I got money. Can I give you some money? I want you to stop for ice cream on the way home. I want them to love church. You know what I'm saying? It's awesome. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I want us to just kind of focus for a moment. We're going to pray. And we're not praying for ourselves right now. I want us to lift this moment and to place it over our city and the need that our city has. My parents live in Simonton. And many of you know the Brazos River is cresting at 50 feet right now. It's like lapping over into the neighborhood next to them. Um, My dad's been up all night helping families get their stuff out with his tractor. And he stayed home to do that. His, he's fine, but there's a lot of families today that are suffering and have great need that many of us are going to go home on dry roads, walk into our homes with air conditioning because we've not lost our power grid, right? But there are a lot of families that are just, they're soaked today and they don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. They don't know how long it's going to take for life to get back to normal. Can I just start this altar time with that as our initiative? And would you, would you agree with me? Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we we are here today to be a representative of you. You are the head, and you're irresistible, and your church should be irresistible, and so should, should our voice. 
And our voice is going into heaven right now saying, have mercy on those families, God, that are in great need today. We're not going to be one to just sit back and say, oh God, bless them. Let this prayer accomplish and fulfill everything it needs to. We have our family members on the grounds now helping. Those that are nearby are already serving and offering assistance. And so, Lord, we are going to lift them up with prayer today. We're going to support them, God, with our heart and our intercession. God, would you meet their needs? Would you protect their families? And those that have suffered loss, we'll start at the top. Eight eight people have, have lost their lives through the storm already, God. And, Lord, there's no telling what trauma that has caused in their families and questions and pain and suffering. But, Lord, we know your Holy Spirit is our comforter. And may I just ask that your Holy Spirit just invade their space today. Invade their hearts with your peace, with comfort, with whatever it takes, relationship, somebody that can be next to them, God, to be your hands and your feet and will support through intercession. God, I pray that as opportunity comes that we don't shy away. We don't think, oh, we don't have enough or our hands aren't, aren't big enough or that our time is not enough. You're the creator of all time. You're the provider of every dollar and you have us here for a reason. And so we see every opportunity as a God moment. Bless us in this. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have a question. Is there anybody here today that literally your house has water? It's standing water in your house today. Because I haven't received any calls. I haven't heard from anybody. Would you stand up if your house has been damaged by this storm? Stand up. Anybody at all? Oh, praise God. Praise God. Okay. So here's how we're going to get this ball rolling. Are you ready? We are going to start with a 24-hour prayer chain, if you will. We have a prayer chain. We have people that are praying for your needs all the time, but this specifically is to pray for an effective door to be opened unto us according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to pray like Nehemiah prayed. We're going to pray like Paul prayed. We're going to pray because we know that the opportunity in front of us is beyond what our hands in the natural can accomplish, correct? It's beyond what our resources that we have in the bank can accomplish. But God has given us this moment. This is our unique and effective moment, and we're praying that God would continue to open this door. Here's how you can be involved in praying. I am providing one-hour prayer blocks for a 24-hour cycle. Okay, It's a one-day, 24-hour cycle. If you believe you have time to offer one hour, and we can stack as many into that hour because that's your hour of prayer, I don't care how many of you want to pray on that specific hour, but we're going to fill a 24-hour day with prayer, and we're going to run that thing for 30 days. Okay? You can go into the foyer at the Welcome Center, and there's a little spreadsheet or a worksheet that's provided, a 24-hour timeline. I want you to write your name, say, count on me to pray this hour, okay? And we're going to fill that joker up. We'll fill the gap. Some of you might get a call from me. If I need more, I might just pick the phone up and say, listen, I feel it. You need to pray. And here we go, okay? Because we are going to pray for 24 hours as a church for an effective opportunity to be opened unto us as we are seeking God's leading in our next steps, okay? And that is going to be provided. We will start June 7th. That's next Sunday at midnight. We're going to start, all right? Now, if you work a night shift, can I make it easy? Take the night hours, okay? If you have a, a husband or a spouse or whatever that actually is working at the airport or working in, in factory or working somewhere and you know they're going to be up, would you help us out by taking some of those night hour spots? And, I mean, it's just practical. You're up anyways. Pray. Paul says, I pray all the time, you know, and, and you can pray while you work. Just pray. Just be thinking about the, the value of the effective opportunity God has for your church for the season that we're in. And we're going to pray for 30 days, and we're going to see in 30 days what God reveals to our leadership. Your leadership, your deacons, your, uh, your elders, and your staff, all of us will be taking ownership because, you know, I, I guess I kind of skipped a little bit here. Or maybe I didn't share the scripture. As Nehemiah got permission from the king, the first thing that he did was he went and inspected the walls for himself. He didn't tell anybody what he was up to. He just said, I got all the resources, I got all the funding, I've got the backing, and I've got the king behind me, and God's behind me. Now I've got to do a little inspection work because I'm going to set the plan in motion. What we're going to do for the next 30 days, how we're going to get it done, is your, your elders and your deacon and your staff, we're all going to be scouring this place, and we're going to take inventory of 
the house for 30 days. We're going to be praying that God show us specifically where we need to make those initial first investments. We have a programming book, which I've already explained to you, that tells us from A to Z how we can accomplish our master plan, if that's the route we want to take. Infrastructure has to be set up for new facilities. We have to do modifications in here so that we can have the seating capacity to match the parking and blah, 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 blah. But that's going to be something that our leaders are going to be praying over for the next 30 days. You're praying that God would speak clearly. Our leaders are praying, Lord, speak clearly in this moment. And in the next 30 or so days, we will come together and we'll publish to you how every dollar that's going to come in for our campaign, Love the House, is going to be sown and how you can expect to see these changes and when you can expect to see these changes and how you'll expect to see these changes. Does that make sense? So let's praise God together that, Jan that next week we're going to start our prayer initiative. In addition to that, this is our prayer time. I need anybody in this house, and I don't normally do this, if you're a boss or if you're a leader of people in any way, if you have people that you have to lead, you're responsible for people, whether that's in the church, in the job, wherever, I want you to stand up right where you're at, please. I, wanna, I need to speak to you. Stand up. If you lead people, responsible for people, please stand. You realize that your authority is only as good as your submission. As you submit to the Lord, He will grant you authority. Everyone that's in leadership is first submitted to someone. There's not any of us running around in our own leadership. You know that. There's always a head. The head is Christ. As the church, we're going to submit to Him. But the, the Word of God says that you've been given this opportunity, blessed with this opportunity, equipped and strengthened with this opportunity by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, this is a part of that scripture that says, if your job is to lead, it says, do it diligently. Can I just tell you that the next season that we are in as a church that's going to be effective into our community and in our homes will require you to be a better leader than you are today. you got to be better. You can, what got you where you are today will not carry you into your tomorrow. Can I just ask you, and by faith that you would pick up a few extra books and start reading on leadership, that you would spend a few extra hours in prayer asking God to lead you effectively in the moment and the season that you have? Can I ask you to spend more time with leaders that are ahead of you? Take and write it into your calendar that you need space for God to fill in his, his, his power and His Holy Spirit for you because you need to be better as a leader than you are today. The only way we're going to accomplish what God is asking us to accomplish is if you take the initiative as a leader to be better. I'm going to do the same, okay? And so this is what we're going to do. I need everybody in this place to lift their hands forward and let's pray for our leaders. Heavenly Father, our leaders are, are standing today because you have given them opportunity to lead people in whatever way uh, you, you've placed them. They're necessary. May you expand their influence as they deepen their submission to you. May you offer them uh, insight through leaders that have gone ahead of them. May they understand better the quality of their leadership, how to speak to those and to lead those and to inspire those, Lord, by example, and to, to undergird those with support. Father, we need to be better leaders in this house. The only way we're going to achieve what we're going to achieve is if we get better at what we are called to do. Your word says if we are to lead, then we need to do it diligently. That word lead also says provide. If we provide for anyone, then we need to do it diligently. So God, I pray that mantle upon us be strengthened in the name of Jesus. And remain standing, please. If you're in this house and you, you are a parent of a child in our ministry here at Faith, or a grandparent, or a family member of anyone that is in our children's ministry that matters to you, I want you to stand and join this list. Please stand all across this place. Thank you. Thank you for standing. I need to tell you something. We will not be average. I'll, I will ask for your money. I have. I will ask for your time. I will ask for your support in prayer. And I, it's my responsibility to connect you to what we're doing in this house. The reason why we can't be average is because there's 200,000 kids out there. And your kids are going to be a better influence than we are. Your kids need to be healthy. 
And, and what I need to do is paint the reality picture for you. Did you know that if you never missed a Sunday or a Wednesday, and you had your kids in this church every time the doors were opened, we would have 104 hours a year to minister to your kids. Sounds pretty good, right? No, it, it's only four days. It's only four full days a year. This is eternal life stuff, right? This is eternity stuff. We only have them for four days. 2% of your child's life while they are awake. I'm giving them eight hours of sleep. While they're awake, 2% of their life is going to be spent learning about Christ. Enrichment. Principles. Care. 16% of their life will be at school. Did you know that it used to be the rest of their life was in through activity or TV time? before they go to bed, and, and, and you gotta factor in eating and stuff like that. Now there's a new term called screen time. Did you know that your children will spend 41% of their life in front of the screen a year? I, I can't compete with that, nor can you. School ain't got it, we only have 2%. So what am I saying? I'm saying get the app called the parent queue. Put this up on the screen, guys. Get the app. There is a pre-K side to it and an elementary side to it. Our students, they have their own thing going, and we're going to rock that with them, and we're going to make sure they have what they need, okay? Those that are in junior high and senior high. But our children, on the way to church this morning, I had 25 minutes with my daughter, and I got to choose. Do I throw my phone to her and let her stream music? play her games, download whatever she wants to, or do I create space for God to fill? And I chose to let her go through the parent queue and choose two videos to watch. I already pre-screened them. They were about lying and honesty. And I got to talk to her about that after it was all over with. You want to win back time? Screen time? Take a bite out of it. Get the parent queue. Invest back into your child. Know that we've only got 2% of that child's life, and we're going we're gonna to do everything we can, and we're going to bust it with the best resources and the best leadership we possibly can. But listen to me. The cue is up to you. How you spend the rest of your day, your dinner time, your bedtime, your drive times, your, your personal times, if you don't win back the screen time, someone else will take it. If we're going to be the church to the next generation and we're going to achieve what God wants us to achieve in reaching out to 200,000 kids that need to know Jesus, we're going to have to probably have to rent some vans and get some people like this guy, bring in 10 of them, and the pastor's going to have to buy a lot of ice cream, and y'all are going to have to have some time with them on the queue. Okay? The rest of you, will you stand with me? I have to believe we're in a season. And this season is one that God's ready to just pour His Spirit into all of us. You may not have children in this ministry. You may not be a boss or a leader. But can I tell you, according to Acts chapter 2, every one of us has a significant role to play. There is a prayer chain that is available. There is intercession that is needed. There are teachers and mentors. And the, the list is forever. But you got to understand, this is your house, your church. These are your tools, and I'm going to ask you to wear the tools out. I'm going to ask you not to be married to anything but your spouse. So when we wear a tool out, we'll replace the tool. And that might be buildings. That might be pews, chairs, stuff, lights, whatever. We wear stuff out. We'll replace that because it's a tool. And tools are used to help you with your mission. And we're going to evaluate our tools. And there will be some things that will need to be modified and upgraded, and it'll be for the mission of our church, and you'll know why. Plenty of time to prepare for it. Does that make sense? But we're in a season where we're listening. We're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to speak. And when he does, we are going to move in that effective opportunity that only he can provide. Bow your heads with me. Dear Jesus, we love and honor you so much, and I thank you for a place of worship. I thank you, God, that you love us and that you give us these wonderful opportunities, Lord, to serve you. Father, I just pray right now that as we've stood, that we don't take lightly these moments. Don't let this just be a person standing at a pulpit exchanging information. God, I'm praying for transformation. 
I'm praying that, God, you would transform our families, God, with the tools that you've given us. We would win back, we would fight to win back the time that our kids are, are, are giving to other things that aren't going to enrich them, strengthen them, edify, build them up, encourage them in your ways, God. There are so many things that are tugging at them. Father, the tools that you've given us at our disposal, we have to use them to the fullest. And God, we will. We've, we've shown you that we'll wear things out around here. But God, it's time for you to, to lead us. We've sown and you have blessed in abundance our sowing into your kingdom. And now, Father, we're going to pray for the house. Pray for those that are in it, those that need to be in it, and those that we're influencing outside of it. What a wonderful privilege it is. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have to ask this because we don't have value without these moments. If you're our guest here today, I'm so honored to have you. But, but right now, we're just praying. If you're here today, and it hasn't been one of those moving and shaking sermons, you know, where, where I'm inspiring you to the, necessarily the cross. I'm inspiring you to the one who, who makes value the cross, and that's Jesus. If you're here today and, and you don't want to leave without knowing who he is or at least starting the dialogue of, of who Jesus is for yourself, I want to just raise your hand real quick. No one's looking around. I want to pray with you before we close and we pray together. Just lift your hand right where you're at and say, Pastor, remember me in this prayer. I really just need to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior in that way. Lift it really, really high so that I know you're not just worshiping God. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's just pray right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. And seeing in me what I couldn't see for myself. I'm not perfect. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Put me on a path that I can be effective, strengthened, and encouraged in you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we put our hands together? I just thank God for what he does. If... Oh, man, put this on my Bible. I shouldn't have done that. All right, good. If you raised your hand or didn't and meant that prayer, in the back of your pew, the blue says saved. Would you take that and just put your name on it? I just really want to know who you are. Get your name, connect with you on your next steps. You can place that in this bucket as it goes by. You can take it right out to the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. You'll receive some stuff in the mail. It's just a journey that we are ready and excited to, to walk with you. Please, if you would, put your name on that and help us out. For the rest of us, can I just tell you that we need to spend about two or three minutes just asking God to speak to us, asking Him to show us this effective opportunity that only He can provide. And you've got to start with who you are. Don't start big and say, okay, what am I going to do at the church or what am I going to do at my job? Start with you. God, what are you doing in me? Because what you're doing in me is exciting. And that excitement's going to be poured out into those around me. If you don't think you're exciting, then you're not going to be pouring out excitement. You're going to be pouring out the mully grubs and whatever else you got pouring out of you, you know, and people are going to be walking by. They're not going to be coming to you. You are alive in Christ. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and let him speak to you. Father, we just stand in your presence right now. And we know, Lord, that there is none like you. And I know, God, that these are times where, you know, we need more of your presence than we need anything else in this world. We've prayed for those that are sick, and I know, God, that your healing power knows no time, no space, no limits, and you've met our needs today. You've commissioned us in our leadership. You've commissioned us in our responsibilities as parents. You've commissioned us as vision, which, which suggests that it's just way bigger than we've allowed it to be, and God, we've got opportunity. So now, what is it in us, God, that you're wanting to celebrate? In us, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your power and the enthusiasm and the excitement of who we are in you. And don't let us leave or, or ever think for a moment that we're not all that you've created us to be. God, inspire us and encourage us to do great things. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to be with Lawrence this week. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to be with all those that need prayer and support this week. Thank you, God, for people like Jeremy that are willing to call the church and get an extra van to pick up a bunch of kids. Thank you, God, that it's just going to inspire one, two, three, ten, twenty, as many as necessary to make this vision happen. Lord, you said to give you space to fill. I don't see that as buildings or seats. I see that as people. Give us the courage to ask people to be a part of what you're doing so your presence can fill them. And we know at that point we will be achieving the kingdom purpose that you've asked us to. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said amen. 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 Give God praise.